Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis.News podcast. Please don't forget at the top of the webpage, there's a donate button. Donald Trump has tried very hard to make this election about his pre-pandemic economic record, which is supposed to be a success story. Of course, he ignores the fact the cyclical upswing of the economy started during the last Obama years. But what Trump tries to trumpet is his approach to trade with China. He claims his tariffs and remarkable negotiating skills have brought hundreds of thousands of jobs back to the United States. Well, the Wall Street Journal reported on October 26 that, quote, President Trump's trade war against China didn't achieve the central objective of reversing a U.S. decline in manufacturing economic data show, despite tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars of Chinese goods to discourage imports. The tariffs did succeed in reducing the trade deficit with China in 2019, but the overall U.S. trade imbalance was bigger than ever that year and has continued climbing soaring to a record $84 billion in August as U.S. importers shifted to cheaper sources of goods from Vietnam, Mexico, and other countries. The trade deficit with China also has risen amid the pandemic and is back to where it was at the start of the Trump administration. Another goal, reshoring of U.S. factory production, hasn't happened either. Job growth in manufacturing started to slow in July 2018, and manufacturing production peaked in December 2018. Manufacturing job growth began to slow when the trade war started and had nearly stopped growing before the pandemic. A little further down, the article continues. Annual change in manufacturing tariffs are, quote, are having the effect of bringing manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Leitzizer said in an interview, citing statistics that show a net gain of 400,000 U.S. manufacturing jobs from November 2016 until March 2020, when the pandemic forced widespread factory closures. However, about 75% of the increase in manufacturing jobs occurred before the first tranche of tariffs took effect against China in July 2018, when annual growth in manufacturing jobs peaked and then began to decline. By early 2020, even before the pandemic reached the U.S., manufacturing jobs had stalled out and factories shed workers in four of the six months through March, end quote. So why is there so little industrial growth in spite of all of Trump's rhetoric? Well, now joining us to help answer that question is Michael Hudson. He's an economist, a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a researcher at the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College. He's also a former Wall Street analyst, a political consultant, a commentator, and a journalist. Thanks very much for joining us, Michael. Well, it's good to be back with you. So uh, Trump made all kinds of promises and and is still uh, blowing his horn about this issue of returning jobs and uh, rebirth of American industrial manufacturing. Uh, But he hasn't succeeded. Why? And, And there's some bigger reasons for that, aren't there? Well, we've talked about these bigger reasons for quite a few years now. Uh, And my point is that the economy's been in a slow crash uh, right along. And the reason is uh, that uh, in order to become uh, an industrial economy, you have to lower the cost of living and lower the cost of doing business. That's what the whole fight of uh, classical economics uh, was all about. But uh, as the economy's uh, more and more financialized uh, and polarized, uh, it's it's impossible to cut costs. Uh, r- you mentioned the pandemic, and uh, health care now absorbs 18% uh, of the GDP. Uh, and if you look at the other costs, uh, uh, if, if you're a, a wage earner, 15% uh, of your income right off the bat goes for Social Security uh, and uh, medical, uh, medical insurance. Uh, you have uh, regular taxes of anywhere about uh, 20%. You have uh, mortgage debt uh, that is up to about uh, 40%, 43% of uh, average uh, uh, income. Uh, at least that's what the U.S. government is willing to guarantee uh, when bankers uh, make uh, a loan. And uh, you have other uh, loans. You have student debt, 
uh, to pay for an education in order to get a job. You have automobile debt uh, to get to the job. And when you add up all of these... Uh, add, extra add, costs, add, add, add credit card debt to that. Credit, absolutely. Credit card debt's been stable, but uh, although the volume of debt, credit card debt's been stable, as uh, people are falling further and more into arrears, their uh, interest rate jumps from about 18% to uh, 29% uh, or more. So uh, the same amount of debt uh, now absorbs a much larger part of your income. So the result of all this is that if American workers uh, in industry uh, got all of their food, all of their clothes, all of their uh, transportation, everything, all of the physical uh, goods and services they use for free, they still couldn't uh, compete. In fact, if uh, they just had to pay their uh, wage withholding for uh, Social Security, medical care, and uh, overall uh, health insurance uh, uh, alone, that is larger than the wage levels in uh, Asia where we're importing things from. So the fact is that the United States has uh, made itself uncompetitive uh, because of this idea that, well, uh, it wants to get rich, and the way to get rich is to go further and further into debt to buy houses that are rising in price. But as houses rise in price, uh, then you have to pay more and more debt service uh, or more and more rents uh, to people who buy uh, the same uh, houses on debt. Uh, and uh, the result is that uh, America's priced out of the market. Well, this is what Ricardo talked about in his free trade theory way back in 1817. Uh, he said that uh, industrial capitalism was uh, not going to be able to take off in England if uh, British workers had uh, to pay rising uh, rents as uh, food prices rose uh, behind the agricultural uh, tariffs that uh, England had. And there was a 30-year uh, fight to uh, finally repeal the agricultural tariffs, the corn laws. And Ricardo said, if you don't uh, uh, stop the economy uh, from having to pay the rentier class, at that time the landlords, then uh, this, you're going to have the Armageddon of capitalism. You're going to have the day of judgment, that uh, rents are going to rise uh, to take so much uh, of the wage earner's income uh, and the industrialist's income that there's no room left for profit. And uh, basically, uh, if you're going to compete with other countries and try to sell or, uh, or uh, buy American goods instead of imports, uh, then you're going to have to pay enormously high costs to pay the rentier class, uh, which is basically the uh, one per, uh, 1%, uh, the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, the fire sector. And uh, instead of becoming an industrial economy, uh, the United States has become a fire sector economy. And uh, Trump has not done anything at all uh, to reduce that. Uh, the economy is getting uh, obviously sicker and sicker once again. Uh, medical costs are going up. Uh, uh, the states and uh, municipalities are broke. Small business has been going out of business. Uh, so where is the demand going to be for uh, domestic uh, American manufacturing? And uh, why uh, uh, would one... Uh, pay uh, man, uh, for manufacturers with labor that's cost 10 or 20 times uh, what it costs abroad when you add up all of these rentier costs into the uh, equation. It can't be done. Well, there seems to be different parts to the argument, um, and they kind of all lead to the same conclusion, uh, a continued uh, lack of industrial jobs in the United States. Uh, but let's start with, the, in the article, uh, it's kind of an obvious thing, uh, in spite of the tariffs uh, against Chinese imports, uh, these American corporations on the whole that are, were producing in China, a lot of them just moved to other cheap wage economies. Uh, they're talking here in Vietnam and Mexico. Uh, so the actual balance of trade didn't change at all. That's right. American corporations are going, are, global, uh, and multinational, and they're going to hire uh, labor wherever it's cheaper uh, than American labor. And that's almost everywhere in the world because no other country in the world has to pay American-style uh, health insurance. No country in the world has to pay residential rents that are charged in the United States. Uh, uh, other countries just don't have the heavy uh, uh, overhead structure 
financial overhead structure that uh, the United States has. Uh, and so there's, there's no way in which these countries, uh, these uh, multinational firms are going to uh, produce in the United States. The, the uh, Trump plan and the Republican plan, uh, in spite of all the demonization of China as being the source of, of all evil, and, and including uh, the virus itself, never mind uh, taking away industrial jobs, which is all a process. Uh, the outsourcing was obviously all an American-driven process, uh, American corporations. Uh, and and, it, and it's, it leads to this kind of uh, dead end because the more American workers' wages and living standards go down, uh, the less they can buy. So even if you're producing cheaply uh, abroad, uh, your market is still getting smaller in the United States. Um, yes, the living standards are going down, but not the wages. Not, and not, and not the cost, not, of the cost not the cost of right. living, just the standard right. of living. <laughs> right. The, uh, and, and, and we're seeing this even in the fight over what to do in the pandemic moment. Uh, the Republicans are against another big stimulus plan. Uh, the Democrats, uh, allow, you know, supported the original uh, couple of plans, but they also supported so much of those plans actually going to defend the uh, cost of assets or the value of assets of the rich, and and not, uh, you know, more went that way if I understand it correctly than actually went to workers and and working families and subsidies. We're talking about uh, eight trillion to the one percent. Two trillion to the rest of the population. Uh, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats made a deal with the Republicans. They both agreed that they wanted to pay their respective campaign contributors, uh, the financial sector uh, and the real estate sector. They wanted to use the pandemic. They said, look, we can't say, they were realistic. We can't save the economy. We can save the stock market. Let's give it eight trillion into the stock market and the bond market and let's save the banks. Let's have the Federal Reserve use some of this eight trillion. Uh, to buy the packaged mortgage loans, the packaged uh, uh, oil oil industry loans, the loans that are going bad. So let's bail out the rich people. Uh, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats uh, really cared about the working class. Uh, I think Trump had some care for the working class, uh, but the other Republicans didn't. And, and the Democrats were uh, said, "Look, what we'll, we'll uh, promise the workers that oh, we'll get to the uh, the fact." We know that the states and local localities are broke. We know that uh, the subways uh, uh, are running at a deficit. We know that uh, the, the cities uh, are broke and they're going to have to lay off, off people. So uh, we really can't deal with that. Uh, let them go under. We'll, uh, Nancy Pelosi said, well, well, we'll get to all that later. And she knew very well that she wouldn't get to that later and uh, that she wouldn't even uh, agree when Trump said, well, let's at least send out another two trillion and the $1,200 checks to everybody, uh, she wouldn't even agree to that. So uh, the Democrats have come out really to the, re to the right of the Republicans, uh, or uh, they've made a right wing uh, shift. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, think you, I don't think you can say to the right of the Republicans, but they sure. Well, it's almost uh, impossible to say. You're right. Uh, it's, let's just say nobody really cared about uh, labor or has been doing, has made any proposals, because in order to deal with the employment problem and the industrial problem, you'd, you'd have to restructure the economy. The economy structures now, uh, now isn't simply a question of not having enough money to live or an, enough money to buy goods and services uh, or enough profit. It's, that, uh, it, it's so malstructured that uh, the uh, industrial economy and uh, the wage labor has been absolutely flat for uh, decades now uh, in, in the big picture. And all of the growth of income, certainly since 2008, all of the growth in wealth has accrued just to the top uh, uh, 10%. It's accrued in the form of rising stocks and bonds and uh, housing prices, uh, but rising housing prices don't make it easy for uh, uh, wage earners because uh, new workers have to pay more and more for the homes that go up. So instead of making the economy richer, uh, this uh, boom in stock prices and also uh, uh, the stock and bond market is uh, making the economy more debt strapped. And if you're a pension, f uh, a worker expecting a pension, uh, the pension funds are only able to make uh, less than 1% on risk-free capital. So they're taking a lot of risks and they're usually taken advantage of by the Sharpies on Wall Street that uh, sell them derivatives as uh, occurred with CalPERS, uh, the California uh, pension fund uh, 
uh, group, and uh, uh, I don't see any way out of it without either writing down the debts, certainly for the debts run up during the uh, the pandemic, writing down uh, the rents that have been just forgiving them that have uh, taken uh, accrued. Because if you leave the last uh, six months of uh, uh, rents in place and debts in place, then you're going to uh, try to start uh, uh, any kind of recovery after the virus is over with this huge backload of rent uh, uh, hanging over you, the huge backload of, uh, backload of debt service. And there's no, one, no way that uh, a lot of companies uh, can stay in business uh, the fracking industry, for instance, uh, and uh, there's no way that uh, a lot of uh, workers can avoid uh, being laid off, especially if they're public employees for cities and states uh, uh, or uh, public agency employees like uh, the New, uh, New York City Transit Authority says, well, we're going to have to lay off our, tran our transit workers because we don't have enough money to pay because uh, no, uh, they haven't been taking public transit in the pandemic and we've had to pay uh, labor, we've had to pay our bondholders. Uh, obviously, something has to give. And uh, I think the Democrats and Republicans are in agreement that what gives is going to be uh, labor's uh, uh, economic conditions, not uh, those of their respective uh, campaign contributors. Well, let's say you got a phone call and I have absolutely no doubt and I, I, there's very few things I have no doubt about, but I have no doubt you will not get this phone call. But let's say you do. And Biden calls you and said, OK, I've been listening to you. And OK, what is you're talking about restructuring. So what, what should I do? And, and I know Biden's not going to call you, but what what should a biden administration do well there's, it's, here's rather, the problem. It's, a rather, it's a very very critical dangerous moment in so many ways well you're personalizing it and the problem is what could any president do uh the tax laws are made by congress uh and uh, uh you've seen uh, with donald trump it doesn't matter what he tries to do uh it it, uh, it it wouldn't matter who's president uh coming in because uh one of the things that's needed to do is to write down the debts uh, that are owed uh, to the banks. The economy cannot recover when it's uh, working under this debt burden. Some peop many people have talked about at least start by writing down uh, student loan debt uh, with the huge uh, default rates uh, there are now. Uh, as long as you leave the student lo loan debt in place, uh, students are not going to be able to qualify for mortgage loans. So they can't buy uh, buy houses of their own because they're already pledging too much of their income to pay. Stu student student debt. debt's around a trillion dollars, is that right? Yeah, yeah, lar it's, it's larger now than credit card debt. Uh, and you can't wipe, uh, thanks to uh, the bankruptcy law that Mr. Biden put in, uh, you can't wipe out uh, the student debt with bankruptcy. Uh, I mean, it was really uh, Mr. Biden, m much more than Donald Trump, that has screwed up the economic system by what he did in sponsoring uh, the, uh, the laws. He, he was the senator from uh, Delaware, New Jersey. I mean, Delaware, uh, which is basically the uh, money, uh, the bank, the corporate banking state. And uh, they called him the senator from uh, the credit card companies. And he represented the credit card companies against labor. His whole career has been fighting against labor. And uh, it's inconceivable that he would ever uh, call someone like me any more than uh, well, he said it on uh, 60 Minutes uh, on Sunday. He said, you know, people think that I'm going to be like Bernie or AOS, but I beat those guys. Uh, uh, you'll never call me a socialist. And uh, 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 when uh, Kamala Harris was asked if she was a socialist or a left winger, she uh, just laughed and laughed and said, how could anyone possibly believe that? And of course, if you look at what she did in California by uh, supporting Mnuchin uh, uh, in all of his uh, fraudulent uh, evictions, uh, she, ports, she supports the real estate uh, owners, uh, uh, even when they're illegally acting against uh, uh, the renters. So uh, uh, neither of them are a friend of labor. So uh, what they would call me is, say, is saying, what we need is a patter talk uh, from you, uh, 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 Mr. Hudson. We know well, don't that, take uh, the phone. Don't take the phone call thing too seriously. <laughs> but, but what I'm getting at is, you know, let's put, let me frame this differently. A progressive people's movement and the progressives that have been elected to Congress 
what should they be demanding? What, what, what do real solutions look like? What they should be demanding is something that cannot be done within the existing two-party system. They should say, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the way to keep down housing prices is uh, and uh, to get the cities and states out of their uh, deficit is uh, to have to, uh, to tax the, the unearned income, tax the land, to, uh, uh, to, uh, have a real estate tax. Uh, that'll collect all this rent that uh, is being paid right now uh, to the banks as mortgage interest. Either you pay the banks uh, the contractual interest that they're due on all of these loans, uh, and you go broke, or you uh, you let the uh, uh, banks uh, uh, basically you realize the banks have become adverse to uh, economic welfare. Uh, you have to let the financial system go and replace it with uh, banking and credit as a public utility. That's what makes China so competitive. Why is China uh, uh, able to uh, outstrip uh, American uh, uh, labor uh, where the, uh, the Chinese have uh, almost, an, uh, I'd say, an equal uh, standard of living from everything that I've seen there? Well, the reason is that uh, China's doing exactly what the United States did to become an industrial power in the late 19th century. They have, uh, China has uh, public utilities, uh, public enterprises, providing basic uh, needs and basic public services uh, at a subsidized rate or freely, such as ed education, free. There's no uh, uh, foreign labor doesn't have education debt like the United States. Education's free. Uh, 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 healthcare is uh, public. It's it's uh, provided freely. There's no huge. Uh, 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 let, let me let me say I, I I think that's not quite as rosy as it appears. Right. Not quite. Oh, you're right. Not quite yeah, as rosy. Because of course, I, my understanding is that while healthcare is supposed to be free and public, that you actually have to wind up having to pay doctors some cash or you really can't get in to see them. Yes, that is a fact. I, I do acknowledge that fact. The but the most important uh, public utility, to answer the question uh, that you brought up, the important thing is that banking and finance in China is a public utility. The government is the creditor. And so when there's a pandemic uh, like this and uh, companies uh, cannot uh, afford uh, to pay the debts uh, uh, or have to lay off labor, the, go uh, the government as banker can say, okay, we're just not going to collect the debt and force you to go under and force you to uh, lay off your labor force. And it's easy to cancel debts when uh, you, the public, uh, sec the government are the creditor because you're canceling debts owed to yourself. And that's one of the main reasons why banking should be a public utility. Uh, and in the United States- Well, uh, in, in uh, some ways, in some ways, banking is a public utility if you're a big bank or if you're a big corporation <laughs> because the Fed actually did essentially give corporations and banks so much cash during the pandemic, they were able to pay off their debts. Absolutely. So it kind of is a public utility for <laughs> if, if you're in the 1%. Yes, you're right. Uh, what I meant is a public utility serving the public, the public interest. <laughs> uh, and this is a uh, public utility. That, uh, obviously, who is going to control the state? Uh, and that really is uh, the key. Will it be progressives uh, that control the state or will it be uh, the 1%? And uh, right now, uh, uh, the, uh, you mentioned what can progressives in Congress do? Well, before you do that, let me just add one thing to what you just said. The, the ability of the major financial uh, corporations and large corporations, although I think finance is by so far the dominant force, right. because if you look who owns almost all of the major corporations, the majority owners are big financial institutions. The majority That's of right. shares are held by big banks and, and, and in particular by uh, asset management companies like BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard, but not only them, there's others. And, and the, the, the power that the financial institutions wield over government is what Roosevelt defined as, as fascism. He said this, this when one sector of the economy, one group of companies essentially controls or owns the government, that's fascism. And, and we are virtually or we are there. I, you're quite right. You're absolutely right.
that is the problem. We are in a centrally planned economy, uh, but the uh, econ- central planning is done on Wall Street, not uh, in in Washington. Uh, and uh, the state uh, now that uh, you've uh, essentially. Uh, privatized and financialized uh, the political process. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that uh, corporations are people and corporations can buy uh, uh, control of the political process. So uh, that's basically what the problem is. Uh, let's get back to fascism because that's very important. Uh, around the time that Roosevelt made that comment, uh, Trotsky analyzed fascism in Germany and Italy. And uh, he said that uh, fascism is what occurred when the socialists don't have uh, a solution uh, to the problems. And so uh, you could say that fasc- I think we are indeed emerging in that kind of fascism today because you don't have the left uh, or in the progressive uh, interests really coming up with a solution to the problems. And that's because this, uh, the uh, only kind of solution is so radical that uh, it can't be solved within the existing political framework uh, and the existing legal framework. Uh, there has to be uh, the equivalent of a revolution. And if the it's not going to be an anti-fascist revolution, then it'll be a fascist revolution. And what we're seeing is that kind of a slow revolution. Uh, uh, and as uh, Warren Buffett said, there is a war and we're winning, but we seem to be the only people that know that the war is on. And the war is on, and uh, uh, we're moving towards uh, uh, an economy by the 1%. And, uh, uh, I mean, fascism basically is the integration of corporations in the state, leaving out uh, the voters and the working class. It's, it's a corporate state. And uh, as you pointed out, we're not simply a corporate state here. Otherwise, at least the industrialists would be uh, trying to run the economy to promote industry. We're in a financialized state. Uh, and that's finance capitalism, which is very different from the industrial capitalism. And many of the left, uh, especially the Marxists, uh, still uh, talk about uh, industrial capitalism as being the problem. And yet industrial capitalism is being phased out in the United States, as you pointed out at the beginning of the show. And it's being phased out by finance capitalism. And uh, uh, that isn't even being discussed uh, here, uh, either by the media or even on the left, there's not much discussion of it. Now, I, I wouldn't say, from what I understand, industrial production is being phased out. Uh, there's certain no, industri- areas, the dynamic certain areas, of industrial capitalism. Yeah, industri- yeah, but there's certain areas of the economy that are still very industrialized, and, and the amount sure. of industrial production is still at no, a no. high rate, but, but, it's, but it's only in very specific kinds of areas, really. Uh, the higher yeah. tech areas and such, the, anything that can be farmed out offshore gets farmed out. But, but this issue of, of public banking, I think, is critical. And, and, I, and I, I think it needs to be focused on because it's not nearly enough in the focus of the demands of the progressive movement. And, and, and like in the Green New Deal and other places, the breaking the, the, the hold of finance over the government and I don't see how that happens without public banking. There's still a lot of talk about breaking up the big banks and, dereg- and regulation. And, and breaking up the big banks probably is a good thing, but it only really works if at the same time you build public banking on a large scale, diverse ownership. It could be owned at federal level, states, cities, regions, uh, cooperatives, uh, co-op banks. Uh, but you need something on a scale that when the big banks... Uh, try to threaten, uh, you know, too big to fail, uh, a government needs to be able to say, well, you, you're not to, you know, go off and fail. You, you can't blackmail us anymore because we have a real public banking system. Well, and I, problem- I, I don't see it happening within this Democratic Party. On the other hand, the demand, I think, needs to be raised uh, far more forcefully. Well, the problem is what is uh, uh, what kind of banking are you going to have? And the whole uh, tradition of American and uh, British banking has been to lend against assets. So uh, banks will not make a loan unless you have collateral to pledge. And the collateral is going to be uh, uh, assets and property that's already in place, mainly mortgages on real estate, but also it could be stocks and bonds or other assets. Banks don't lend to finance uh, uh, industry building new capital. Uh, They'll lend to uh, uh, corporate raiders who will buy out industry, 
uh, they will lend to the, uh, what you call the industries you cited, and uh, that includes uh, the uh, high-tech industries. This isn't the old kind of industrial capitalism uh, industry. These are monopolies, and uh, 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 Amazon and uh, uh, the other, uh, Apple uh, and Google, uh, make their money off uh, monopoly rents. It's not really profits. That's why they sell it uh, nearly a trillion dollars. Uh, it, uh, it, it's uh, the economy's geared towards uh, not only land rents and interest, but monopoly rents. And when I talked about industrial capitalism, I, I was talking in uh, the Marxist sense of uh, the dynamic of industrial capitalism, certainly as it was developing in the 19th century, was to cut the cost of living, to cut the cost of uh, doing business by getting rid of uh, all rents. And so it was the business class in the United States. It was the industrial class. It was the Republicans in the 1880s and 1890s that pressed for public uh, uh, um, uh, enterprises. And Simon Patton, who was the first uh, economics professor at the Wharton School of Economics, said public enterprise is a fourth factor of production. And, but un, unlike uh, uh, business investment and uh, industrial investment, it's not there to make a profit. It's there to provide basic services at a low price to subsidize the cost of living and the cost of uh, doing business so that uh, industrialists can uh, uh, minimize what they have to pay, uh, the basic wage to labor, and what they have to pay to do business with, and they can afford to undersell the rivals. Now, that's exactly what China is doing by having the public enterprises uh, headed by public banking uh, to uh, provide credit. That's exactly what Germany did. Uh, its banking was very different from American banking and, and uh, British banking. A German banking would actually create credit to finance uh, capital investment by heavy industry, especially the war industries, but also uh, steel, all the heavy, all the big industries were, uh, got their financing uh, uh, from the banks that also organized uh, the stock investment uh, not, to, uh, get, not to support stock prices, not to get quick dividend payouts, but to keep reinvesting the earnings in capital expansion. That, again, is what uh, China's done, uh, as Germany did, and as the, as the United States did uh, in the 19th century. But uh, uh, and, uh, that was the whole dynamic of industrial capitalism, to keep uh, economic rents at a minimum. But now we're in a rentier society of, uh, backed by the financial interests, and you're absolutely right. It's the banks that are uh, the mother of monopoly. It's the banks that are protecting uh, the large uh, monopoly uh, industries. It's the banks that are pressing for states and municipalities to sell off their uh, assets like uh, uh, Wall Street forced uh, Chicago to sell its sidewalks, to put parking meters up, to vastly increase the cost of uh, uh, driving around in, uh, uh, in Chicago uh, from when Goldman Sachs uh, uh, lent against uh, that right. Uh, so a road, it's the banks in the financial sector that are turning regular highways into toll roads and now they're uh, coming to New York and say well uh, maybe uh, your subways are broke well we don't think they're really credit worthy but why don't you privatize them and uh, we'll do what uh, Margaret Thatcher did uh, with the uh, uh, the transportation in England and of course uh, once it's privatized they're going to build debt service and interest rates and management fees and stock buybacks all into the cost of providing subway service or bus service or road service and uh, the economy is on the same trajectory that uh, England was on under Thatcher and Tony Blair. Uh, and that's really the problem. What kind of capitalism are we going to have? If, if you look at the critical problems facing the, our society and societies around the world, really, uh, the solutions are all socialized solutions. There's yeah. no way that uh, you can deal with the climate crisis without some kind of central planning without government driving it, and without socialized solutions. Just the way Medicare for all makes perfect sense. If Medicare for all makes perfect sense, the same principle can be applied in other areas of the economy, certainly starting with banking. But the more the, the problems cry out for more socialized solutions, if you want, you can use this terminology of mixed economy, for the more socialist characteristics of the economy to come more to the fore, it's so obvious that's what needs to be done, 
or the society is not going to last. Uh, but on, even, even when you read some of the documents, like I, I, re, I follow BlackRock and I read their research papers, they even recognize, at least in words, the, the urgency and danger of the climate crisis. But it's obvious from what they say, they don't reach the conclusion, but they come right up to the edge of the conclusion, that the marketplace on its own will never uh, allow or force uh, investors to change the way they actually invest. BlackRock claims they're, ba they're getting out of coal, but it's smoke and mirrors if people want to see the analysis I did of that. I have an article on the website about BlackRock. But, but the market mechanism will never change the course to phase out fossil fuels relatively quickly, yeah. have a massive investment in uh, green sustainable energy. That doesn't happen when, when the, the model of the financial industry, which is quickest maximum return on their capital investment, that only government can do that, but government can't do that when it's controlled by finance. So this issue of a, of a more socialized solution, like you asked, is what version of capitalism solves it? I think the version of capitalism is no version of capitalism in the sense that the socialistic characteristics of, cap, of, uh, of capitalism really have to come so to the fore that there really has to be a transition to far more public ownership. Well, a century ago, everyone thought that capitalism was leading to socialism, and uh, that was uh, shared by the large industrial firms. Uh, they wanted to socialize the costs uh, of the economy. They wanted to socialize the uh, uh, land. Uh, it was the industrialists, uh, Ricardo and uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, it was an industrialist that wanted to get the land tax and to, to get rid of the landlord class in England. Now, in all throughout Europe, the, it was the upper house of government, the uh, House of Lords or uh, uh, the Senates and, uh, that block, tried, to every, tried to block any kind of reform uh, not only leading to socialism, but leading, that helped capitalism. And there had to be a political revolution strengthening the House of Commons relative to the House of Lords. And that occurred in 1909 and 10 in England. Now, here you're going to, uh, you're going to have to have a similar uh, constitutional crisis in order to uh, do the uh, uh, socialist uh, policies uh, that you mentioned. And the crisis is not only because there's one of federal Federalism in the United States of states' rights that written in the Constitution to to have an economy that can rescue uh, American industry and rescue uh, the American working class. You need to rewrite the Constitution. But uh, the uh, efforts to uh, make plans for a constitutional convention have all been done by the, the ultra-right, uh, by the Federalist Society and by the people that uh, you and I have made fun of uh, for many years. Uh, uh, and I don't see uh, any movement on the left to say uh, we, the situation is so serious that we need a radical rewrite of the Constitution in order to become really a parliamentary democracy that can uh, provide the political context in order to introduce socialist policy. So the problem is not only economic, uh, the, the problem is that to solve the financial and rentier economic problem, you need to, to uh, restructure the political problem here uh, along lines that were restructured in Europe and uh, obviously uh, in China. Well, I, I don't want to get too much into China because I find it right. too, too complicated and <laughs> it's a whole nother conversation. Okay. But that said, we're in a moment where we don't have much time climate wise. You know, we're talking yep. less than a decade. And, and you know, and, and the truth is, given the way the politics is right now, we're not going to make the kind of moves that need to be made in less than a decade. But at least I have to say with the Biden administration, as, as much as I agree with your critique of the Democrats and Biden, uh, at least it's a conversation about what a climate policy should be. I think four more years of climate denial are a complete disaster. Uh, but there is something about the 19th century which I think is telling or informative about what might be possible here. And this is a bit of a Hail Mary, but anyway. Uh, when it came to child labor, uh, I guess we're in the mid 19th century, uh, the, the, a section of the capitalist class understood that if the 
uh, mines and, and mills and factories continued to exploit child labor to intent, as intensely as they were, they were actually going to prevent the reproduction of the working class. There weren't going to be enough workers. They were literally wiping out the working class of England. And, and those voices that saw the systemic interest of the class interest of capitalists was served with laws prohibiting child labor. And, and it won. And of course, the working class that was still just getting organized into unions, but fought for these laws as well. Uh, but but the, the systemic interest asserted itself, and, and they did outlaw child labor. Well, we're in that kind of moment now. The, the systemic interest, uh, threat, the threat of climate uh, disaster, is going to demolish uh, the, much of the assets of the capitalists. Uh, maybe not tomorrow, but certainly it's, it's within sight, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, every time you look at the scientists' assessment of, of what's happening in terms of climate change, it always seems to be changing faster than they thought it would. The uh, estimates of the IPCC always turn out to be conservative, and it's actually more dangerous than people thought. Uh, so we we don't have the, the problem is we don't have time to re, rewrite a con to politically win the, the power to rewrite a constitution and honestly we also don't have the time to have a kind of political revolution the way Bernie Sanders even talks about but to the point where you can develop these socialist characteristics or so, socialistic side of the economy uh, even though it has to happen. There's, there, there has to be a way that a mass movement can both force, persuade, demand that s at least some sections of the, of the elites, and it's going to be hard for finance because they are in an orgy of profit making. But you know, they got to get that this is, they're not going to be able to reproduce their own wealth the way this is going because climate's going to destroy it. Uh, but, uh, Paul, they don't care. The financial yeah, time frame not. is short term. You're, what you're talking, the climate change does not exist within this year. And this year is where their perspective ends. Finance lives in the short run. They think they can always take their money and run. It, uh, and as long as they live in the short run, they only care about their bonuses. They care about the stock price. What you're talking about is something's going to happen in more than 12 months. Uh, and just as politicians usually don't care more than the four years uh, presidential term or the six year Senate term, their time frame, the, uh, the, it's a mentality. And the mentality of the 1% being financialized is the financial mentality of living in the short run. And uh, uh, the, when you uh, criticize the market, it, as you correctly did before, the problem is that the market is short term. The market is a cross section at a given moment of time. And you're talking about where it's all leading in the future. And this is what uh, business economists call an externality. Uh, and the statistics will treat global warming as an externality, external for their economic models. In other words, it doesn't matter for the things that they care about. And they care about the 1% cares about quite different things than the 99% uh, and, it, and progressives uh, care about. So it's that mentality that you're dealing with and the mentality is not going to change. And even on the uh, uh, interview on 60 Minutes on Sunday night, uh, uh, Vice President Biden said, don't worry, he's not going to cut back fracking. Uh, it's more important to support uh, fracking pro profits, and uh, even if it pollutes all of the water sources, and even if it, if it pollutes the water and destroys uh, the environment, uh, we're going to be for it because uh, Wall Street lent money about against, uh, against it, and uh, we're supporting the, uh, the banks that, support, that uh, rely on the frackers or the banks will be in trouble. I mean, that's where we are right now. Nobody is, is making a move to uh, save the environment, uh, apart from global warning, the, the water supply, uh, uh, the air supply. Uh, nobody, uh, the, I don't see any way of uh, introducing this in uh, an economy where the whole mentality of the powerful people who make the laws uh, are short-termists. Yeah, I know. The, they once asked Marx, the, what, what's the mentality of a capitalist? He said, Après moi la deluge, after me come the floods. 
That's which right. Is a quote from Louis the Yeah, they're going to buy. They're going to buy uh, houses in uh, New Zealand if they can get there. You know, somewhere high up. Uh, uh, that that is I mean, the mentality. I, 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 I mean, I don't have any great hope that it happens. I certainly don't have any great hope that it happens, in, other than a few individual cases. But whatever might happen only happens if there's a, a very large scale, well organized progressive mass movement with a political uh, agenda, um, and and within those conditions, they it may be the uh, th the science gets clearer, the threat gets clearer on climate. There there is a point. I I I really do think there is a point uh, that where the effects of climate change would get so profound, so serious, uh, that finance would see it in their interests. And I think there are some sectors, I'm told by people that know uh, people in high up in finance, the, the, quite a few of them are getting the, the, the urgency and danger of it, but they can't break out of their business model. Uh, that, that's the problem. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, uh, what surprises me, all you need are a few billionaires, a few rich people to endow uh, a progressive movement, even in the Roman Empire, uh, as it was uh, collapsing and leading into the Dark Age. You had uh, members of the elite saying, this is a, a hell of a way to uh, 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 make a living or make an empire. Uh, things have to change. And of course, that, that led to such a revulsion against wealth and short-termism that you had Christianity uh, spreading. People just uh, uh, got revolted at uh, the, the selfishness and the greed in the short-termism of the Roman Empire. I would have thought something would happen here in the sense, but that takes some individuals. And if you look at who are the, what are uh, wealthy people giving donations for, uh, it's, it's not going to be the foundations that are really uh, uh, what you and I would call progressive. All right. Well, let's uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thanks for joining us, Michael. <laughs> it's good to be here, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. And speaking of donations, don't forget there's a button at the top of our webpage. page. <laughs>